management strategies across, you know, across the United States when it comes to invasive plants vary. Um, this one is, you know, you'll see everything from garlic mustard pulls. The conservancies are really, you know, interested in making sure our native plants have the ability to reproduce and thrive without competition from an invasive plant or, you know, an aggressive plant like garlic mustard, which I can completely appreciate. Using herbicides or any kinds of chemical applications, I always kind of tilt my head at when I think this plant came over with humans to eat and we're trying to kill it with herbicides <laughs> and it's a plant full of nutrition. So if you wish, you can go ahead and take, did you, if you captured a leaf, if not, you can grab a plant, give it a taste, crush it up in your fingers. Um, I had mentioned, you know, of course this is only after you've favorably ID'd, positively ID'd a plant, and not just kind of ID'd a plant, but you really know what it is, right? It's important that you know what it is. I'll talk about another plant in a minute, why that's important. Can you crush it up, put it under your nose, and maybe even, you know, taste it and, and give it a chew? And I've said it's okay, and it's a really bitter plant. It was also harvested today at three o'clock in the afternoon in the bright sunshine. That is not the time to harvest garlic mustard. Garlic mustard is best harvested in the cool early morning. How many of you grow lettuce? Okay, only a couple. Um, anybody that grows greens knows that greens are best harvested in cool weather. The greens, if you harvest them in the heat of the day, in the heat of the sun, it increases the bitterness and reduces the sweetness. It's opposite with berries, right? You want to pick your berries and pick your tomatoes. When the sun's on them and it's full sun and the sugars are high, um, think about grape growing. You want to have those sugars be super high to get maximum sweetness. It's the opposite with greens. Um, harvesting these in the cooler weather, temper the bitterness and bring out the garlic. So you can go ahead and crush it up. This is a, anybody making basil pesto right now? Awesome. Totally and encourage basil pesto making. You can add fistfuls of this. Every spring I make a pesto to kind of bridge, because I always invariably <coughs> make a lot of basil pesto. And by the time spring rolls around, I am so desperate for greens. Like Mud Lake Farm, they're a great four season you know, greens grower. We've got a couple of great farmers that can produce greens for us. But the minute these guys push through the soil, I'm out there munching and my body's like, Oh my gosh, thank you for feeding me food that isn't in one of those little plastic <laughs> clamshells with pallid, limp spinach. <laughs> and we all know what that's like, right? You're like, it's round in the end of February, you're going into the home stretch of winter. And like, as humans, for some reason, we know to reach for these wild greens in early spring. We get a second, you know, those greens come back in the fall. So the dandelion greens, the garlic mustards, the nettles, all of those plants that we would have in the early spring, we have in the late fall, as well as acorns. Seriously, we could be here for six hours with all the plants I brought. Crazy, huh? <laughs> so garlic mustard. Um, pesto works well with coconut oil, walnuts. Um, I don't really like, so pesto simply means paste. So pesto doesn't mean pine nuts and basil, though most traditionally that's how we know pesto. Pesto is the most fabulous, lazy way. I'm like totally all about shortcuts in cooking. So any way I can combine herbs and plants like um, nettle, garlic mustard, I'll put them all in my food processor, add copious amounts of garlic, never met I had a garlic I didn't like, sea salt, good cracked pepper, and hit blend. And then I put that into canning jars, put it into my freezer, and I'll be taking scoops of that all winter and adding those flavors into my quiches, into my frittatas, using it as a spread. So much cheaper than the $5.99 for the plastic container, which is insane. I do a lot of this foraging because I'm just cheap. <laughs> I do, it's like purseling. Oh my gosh, if it's at the farmer's market for $7.99, I really hope, if you're my friend, you never pay $7.99 for purslane. I will make fun of you on Facebook. I have no problem. <laughs> like, that is just crazy talk. I mean, maybe out of desperation I've bought pesto, but like, for the most part, you know, you can blend together different greens. Um, 
who has kids and who loves burying extra nutrition in their food so their kids, right, you know, we all, or even partners that are kind of like nutrient pansies. <laughs> like, just slip it in there. I, you know, I've got a partner now that would never, actually it's just become kind of a novelty. Oh, what did tweet have you added to my breakfast this morning? It's like, well, this time it's nettles or this like garlic mustard. You know, I actually maintain garlic mustard populations in the springtime by cutting those greens and putting it into the omelets that I make for breakfast. I mean, it's just right out the door, super free. Um, you know, I really do love that these foods are available to us. Um, I always love that I'm, I'm grateful for that added nutrition I can bring into my home, but I always do look at it as a relationship. I look at it as a relationship with my plants, as a relationship with the soil. Um, I teach my children um, how to say thank you to the earth. Like I don't view, because of the as sort of the environmentalist that my dad instilled in me. <laughs> you know, I'm obligated to be a steward for the resources that we have, and um, and I think that's an important part of being a forager, and especially. Um, you know, because our, our earth does need a lot of help and care in that way. So that's like the only side, side rant about that. So questions about garlic mustard at all. I brought a ton of plants and I'm almost like not even sure which one I want to talk about. No questions yet today? I did want to let you know there's someone watching online who, For real? who just saw you at the herb fair. Hey! Yeah. We're being live streamed. I don't know where we're being live streamed to. <laughs> but this is kind of neat. This What did you call it? I mean, Periscope. Periscope, it yes. It sounds like a medical treatment. It, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It just seems quite invasive, but I'm okay with it. We're open and transparent. Do I look okay? You do. You look How great. do my plants look? Can you see that? <laughs> Um, so, a couple things I want to touch on permission. People say, where can I find land to forage? And I do, put, so one of the calls I use, or example I use, this is several years ago, a friend who was then a client called and said, Lisa, I'm going to the Tetons next week. Can you teach me everything you know about wild edibles before I go so we can go back country without food? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't think my insurance would let me even take that on. That's insane. <laughs> you know? And I said, hon, I, you can come over and I can show you some plants, but if you've got some catching up to do, if, you know, this is, you're looking next week and you're looking at ID, and I'm like, you've, yeah, you, it's going to be a while. Um, for me, I feel, I, you know, recommended to you to step off your patio and start to ID plants. That's one of those due diligence things. If you can't ID some of the plants in your own neck of the woods, it's hard to justify going to another place to take plants and to use plants. It's um, a couple of things. For, certainly it's not safe. However, once you develop the skill for learning how to negotiate plant families and knowing how to use an ID guide and knowing how to suss out and I properly identify your wild edibles, it's a skill that is very transferable across continents. And it can make you, you know, just again, it's that human story. We've gone and evolved all over the world, um, traveling to new places and connecting with the natural world wherever you end up. Having this skill will make, make it so you're never alone. Even if you have to move across town and leave your gardens, you know, those wild weeds can be those like wild gardens, even in the interim that you don't have a vegetable garden. So I've had that personal experience and I'm very glad that I know the wild plants. So having permission, you know, making friends with your local farmers, fabulous strategy to have access to land. Make a friend with an organic farmer. They will have more burdock than you could do with, you know, one of my stories, people say, how do you come by the, the name Burdock and Rose for your company? And um, Burdock, which is in Asian communities, is a traditional food called gobo. You can find it at the Asian market or just at Trillium Haven Farm in the hedgerows by, you know, the Poundfall. Um, it's a wild and weedy plant. You dig up the root and it's this beautiful crunchy vegetable that you can saute, cut up into um, for raw salads. You can pickle it. 
and it's you know some a plant that Michael, the owner of Trillium Haven, says, at least you can come and get this burdock anytime you want. Little did he know when I started doing that, I would also leave his field pockmarked because when you start digging up burdock root, who's dig, dug burdock, wild burdock ever? Who's trying to get rid of it in their garden? No? Okay. It's a big, yeah, exactly. <laughs> big broadleaf weed. <laughs> Pull it right off. Yeah, it's, and it can be massive. The fortunate thing about um, Trillium Haven Farm is it's a former muck field making uh, for, from our celery farm, making that soil super easy to pull that, well not really pull, you still need like a shovel, to pull that root out of the ground, but you can end up digging a footprint of a good five feet in diameter to get the entire root out. Um, knowing those wild and weedy plants are always, always a really uh, good way to add uh, nutrients or foods to your table but asking a local farmer, there are always weeds, that, like the purslane, um, the lamb's quarters, the nettles, uh, an early story foraging at Trillium Haven, they're cultivating these huge flatbeds of really pretty kale, like the sexy kale that goes to the farmer's market, it's, you know, all of its containers, and the guys are pulling these trucks, and I walk by, and I'm heading out to the, the nettles ditch, and some of you have harvested with me those nettles, and I'm just carrying my bags of nettles and they're pulling these flatbeds of kale and it was just much easier for me to go gather the nettles in the ditch than what took them a lot, lot of labor. I have some farmers here, lots of labor of love. Embrace the ditch weeds, guys. It's really much easier, okay? Lazy gardener here, telling you. I mean, there's a lot of effort going into that kale. Uh, municipal parks. Now, there are very vague rules written about foraging here in the local park system. Um, in fact, I work really closely with Ada Parks and Rec, Grand Rapids Parks and Rec, and East Grand Rapids Parks and Rec directors. They all have concerns about poaching plants in the park districts. Really, you know, legally we have an obligation, whether you're on a national park, BLM land, state land, from a municipal to federal land system to know specifically what's allowable in addition to knowing if what you're gathering is endangered, threatened, or a wildflower protected or invasive, of course. So, you know, getting permission is really important. Um, people really wouldn't think that that's an issue, but gathering plants, you know, does impact sustainability. People ask if I harvest from our local parks and I don't. I use them only as teaching labs. I'll take people through, I'll show them the plants, I'll use them in de as demonstration spaces, but I don't feel having spent so much time in the parks around this area and up into northern Michigan that we have the land and open space to just open forage. There are just too many people and not enough land. Uh, acorns, that might be another subject, or the walnuts that Natalie had, but for the most part, you know, finding those, those parks as foraging spaces, I really generally encourage um, people to find other places. Questions about permissions? One were field guides. Um, the bookstore here, as well as our local library, have a compendium, Peterson Field Guides. I don't feel any one field guide is going to do it. I really feel multiple field guides. Um, for me, I included color photos, sketches. Botany in a Day is a good book for beginner botanists to learn about plant families. Um, the resources are really quite exhaustive when you start to seek um, beginning resources. In my own book, I chose plants that are easy to identify without any poisonous lookalikes, with the exception of the carrot, the wild carrot. Okay. Um, the second question was, which we'll talk about next. The second question was, how can you identify if, or know if a plant's been contaminated with an herbicide or pesticide? Most of the time, 
most of the time you don't know. Um, there are a couple ways, you know, the, I mentioned things to be concerned about, heavy metals, contaminants, knowing the history of the land as a forager is going, you're not testing the soil, right? And you're not testing those plant parts. So you have to kind of rely on deductive logical reasoning as to if you think land's contaminated, you might go with your gut instinct and find a different place to harvest. Um, knowing your plants and the plant parts helps you understand how potential contaminants could populate in a plant. Not all plants take up nutrients and contaminants the same way, okay? I mentioned if you're downriver from something, meaning a cafe, a factory farm, or even, you know, just every time it rains, and I grew up in the Spring Lake Grand Haven area in the 80s, every time it rained, Grand Rapids, my dad, we'd have an E. coli non-contact advisory. My dad wasn't happy that we couldn't be on the water. <laughs> now, that happens, that still happens quite frequently, non-contact advisories. If you're out harvesting your nettles in a wetland adjacent to an area for a non-contact advisory, or downstream from agricultural runoff or a factory farm, or even just a small scale animal farm, that could mean potential contaminants of salmonella and E. coli. You're not gonna be able to necessarily test for that, but those are things you really should be giving consideration for. Wetland harvesting, harvesting cattails, harvesting um, any of the wetland plants, also along with nettle can take up the, you know, the different contaminants. The wetlands, those are our lands, that, um, lymphatic system. So like our bodies have lymphatic systems that can help clean and clear disease um, and illness. The wetlands are those, those mechanisms for the land and can really help clean and re rejuvenate contaminants. So if you're gonna be harvesting from that, you really have to have some sense of place and what could possibly be running into those areas. In western Michigan, the biggest problem with our watersheds is agricultural runoff. So any, any place you're harvesting downstream, this is why as a forager, wetland conservation and ag, you know, really working in agriculture, that impacts my wild plants, that impacts my watersheds. We can't be foragers and not talk about some of these issues because it's all connected. So I didn't give you a direct answer. Um, you can start to recognize signs of herbicide treatment by plant burn. So Japanese knotweed is a delicious springtime wild edible. Tremendously invasive. Parks management and um, along easements, public easements, herbicide applications are used. And it looks like a distinct chemical burn. You can tell, like if everything's green, and you have a, an eight by eight area that clearly has been browned and dried up, it's like, huh, that's probably you know, a chemical burn, deductive reasoning. If it is an easement, we have the public right to call our utilities companies to ask about topical sprays, but they don't always disclose. Um, at the Blanford Nature Center, when I was the director there, they have about three miles of easement through the Nature Center. I came back to my desk one day to a note from consumers letting me know after the fact that they had sprayed my easement. Unfortunately, I also had summer camp kids out gathering, you know, <laughs> water quality samples and playing in the raspberry bushes that same day. And it was like we had a conversation of how we work with public notice, but as individuals, you know, they're not the best with public notice, so trying to suss out, learning what that plant spray might look like, learning the growth cycles of individual plants, that's also part of the responsibility of, of being a forager and with those wild edibles. Does that make sense? Okay. Easements are a, a big one. So who knows this plant? Queen Anne's Lays. So who knows if this is also wild carrot? I'm gonna pass this around. Um, Queen Anne's lace 
also looks quite similar to a poisonous plant, Conium maculatum, the poison hemlock. Um, one of my friends who's here who's doing this periscope streaming, <laughs> she learned from me early on, don't gather things in the poison hemlock ditch, which is a really good thing to know, but how are you gonna know what poison hemlock looks like as opposed to the wild carrot? Well, the wild carrot, or Queen Anne's lace, and it's not by this little black dot. My mother would always say, look for the little black dot. Well, this one doesn't have, that does a little black dot. They don't always have black dots. The key to knowing the difference between Queen Anne's lace and um, poison hemlock is that the queen always has hairy legs. <laughs> it has a rough stem and hairy legs. And underneath this umbel-shaped flower, is this bract that looks like petticoats. So she also has under things. She has hairy legs and under things, okay? Poison hemlock doesn't have either of those. Its stems are smooth. Both plants can be streamed or streaked with purple fruit. Um, and the flowers, once you start to recognize poison hemlock, it doesn't look like wild carrot, but it can. The first leaves of poison hemlock and the first leaves of wild carrot look really the same. The um, second, or the dried plant that I'm passing around right now, the seeds, when the plant dries, its umbel dries upward and it grows to close, almost like a bird's nest shape. It closes up. And if you want, you can go ahead and scratch the root and even crush up some of the seeds. These dry seeds. Oops, sorry, I just sprinkled you with me as I see. Oh, look at it, there's a worm. Hi. Thank <laughs> you, Dad. Go ahead and, and pass those around and pull them up into your nose to give them a smell. They should all smell like carrot. Okay, the, the carrot root isn't that substantial. It's spindly and kind of thin. I'm going to say, you know, it's not some the, one of the carrots I pack in my kids' lunch. Um, they wouldn't be very happy with me. Actually, if you let all of your carrots in your garden grow over a couple of years, they rewild themselves, actually, to look just like the wild carrot. Kind of neat, huh? Mm -hmm. But what you can do with it, yes, go ahead. I'm um, sorry. There's a plant that some of my friends have been talking about uh, in the Facebook pages, where it looks just like Queen Anne's Lace, but it's green. I guess it's very dangerous. You don't want to get near it. It's probably the giant hogweed they're talking about, which looks very different than Queen Anne's lace. So the tricky thing about this plant, it's part of a group family of plants in the APACA family. So this is where botany comes in handy. Um, they have these umbel shaped flowers, um, cow parsnip is in that family, poison hemlock, water hemlock, um, the giant hogweed, which grows to 15 feet tall and is about to take over the world. I've never seen it. People frequently mistake point, uh, cow parsnip for um, the giant hogweed. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> um, you know, I think we do, and Facebook is definitely, um, can really just create really, it's like a game of telephone, right? It's like all of a sudden poison hemlock and, or giant hogweed which actually, poison hemlock's way worse than um, giant hogweed. Poison hemlock's everywhere. Like, on the drive to Chicago, I, you know, there are fields of it. I'm like, dude, that's like so kill you dead plant. <laughs> I look at Wendy here because if I take her into the fields of Trillium, where there's all this nettle, but then there's this huge swath of Conium maculata that's like towering eight feet tall, and I'm like, you get into that plant, you crush it up with your fingers thinking it's wild carrot, and you go to smell it, the alkaloids and neurotoxins actually will absorb through your skin and shut down your nervous system. That's how Socrates died. So, like, it's, that's really, like, knowing your botany is kind of important. <laughs> but the identifiers with the wild carrot, the queen always has hairy legs, um, and she has those petticoats underneath. Now, edibility, I love the seeds. If you're just on a hike and you have bad breath, you can actually chew on the seeds. It's a great, it's a great mouth refresher. Trail runners, you know, always you've got like dry mouth or just want to chew, it will actually cause a tickle in your throat. So if you don't have any water to, to throw back, it's, you don't want to, you know, start to please. 
Um, but you know, I'm always walking along and nibbling on the carrot seed. It's a great breath mint. Um, ground up into a powder added to sea salt and cracked pepper. You know, that's a great apothecary, a, cul a nice culinary spice. Um, I add it to soups, I add it to stews. The carrot root, you know, if, you know, it's like stone soup, stone soup style. You know, I, I'm not necessarily in a place where I, I, you know, don't have a farmer's market or grocery store. I do have those resources in my home, but the root, the stock, the, the flowers, the seeds, those can get thrown into a stew and can help flavor. If you are camping or if you are doing some trail and backcountry stuff, that's an easy plant ID to put into your soups and stews. I really do love the seeds though, crushed up um, and ground up by a mortar and pestle with the like a smoked sea salt. It's just a really nice way to add Michigan, you know, into your spice cabinet. Um, at a plant walk up in Harbor Springs, I have a fun story about the flowers. Never judge people. I mean, in general, that's a really good rule to live by, but this, and I never know the stories of people that come to my classes. I love it when they end up sharing them with me. But there was this gentleman, I figured his, his wife brought him, right? He's like, I don't know, your wife bring you? <laughs> <laughs> right, and it's yeah. easy. <laughs> you know, you have the wife thing. I, you know, I've, I've been there. <laughs> You know, he just looked like he just got off the golf course, right? And I'm like, this guy's going to think I'm crazy. <laughs> I'm going, here I am, and let's, let's you know, the, the wild plant lady. This guy's just off, you know, off of, uh, you know, golf and 18 holes. Afterward, he came up to me, and he was very attentive the entire class. And, you know, we were walking around Harbor Springs talking about wild plants, and he came up to me and he said, you know, I really want to tell you one of my favorite things I like to make didn't see this coming, is my wild Queen Anne's lace jelly I like to make every summer for my family. <laughs> and he was so excited to share with me how delicious his Queen Anne's lace flower jelly was. And I said, that's fair. It's just it's, it's one of the sweetest things. So yes, the flowers, if you want to go and pass those flowers around, crush them up. They're different scent than the, the seeds. They're more floral than they are green. And so plants, you know, that carrot, you know, the, the wild carrot, it's a nice example of how different plant parts can have different flavors, different utility. Um, you know, and it's just, everybody views it as a weed, and I view it as a beautiful wildflower. So, questions about wild carrot? I do have a question about birds. Are they birds? Um, yes. If like you birds, see, like with wings. Right. Are they, <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. Well, I entertain the question. <laughs> I plan to bring this here anyway because I'd like to know what the heck it is. It's growing over my fence in my yard. But ah. this afternoon, I saw a female cardinal sitting on top of the fence busily eating these nice berries that I'd like to eat too, oh. and then spitting the seed up. And I thought, well, I wonder if they don't kill her, they maybe won't kill me. <laughs> I'm, I'm not. I'm. I'm not really sure what they are, but I think they might be either a dogwood variety. But I'm not. I don't eat those berries. Yeah, well, it's a vine that's growing yep, up yep, over yep. the fence. Over the yeah. fence. Yeah. I. I wouldn't always take the lead. You know, it's one of those things that you know. I don't know every plant, and the plants I know are the plants I love. But that's something that I can take a sample of it, and I can check my books, you and you can double, check your books, the whole thing. <laughs> well, you can write your name on it. Oh, if you'd like can, to see it, he thinks he maybe sees it. And we can pass it around, and somebody else might know offhand. This man thought he might know what it is. Do you know what it is? I don't know. Let me see. Don't put me in the camera. Well, we can I see the, uh, uh, we'll see if anyone in the Periscope line. land knows, yeah, if we can get a picture of it. Yeah, it might be bittersweet. I think hmm. they're bittersweet berries. Oh, there's the berries. Sure. Are you familiar with Datura right yet? Yes, but I'm not going to talk about Datura tonight. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't bring Datura. No, I know. I didn't expect you to bring it. I just have a question. You're dead now. Uh -huh. I'm not going to be responsible. <laughs> Is it bitter? It can be. Yeah, well, it's it's, it can be, it well, can be hallucinogenic it like to some kind of a wild humans. Current. Yeah. So, but, but you know, it's, it's did your dog eat it? No, but there's a lot of it in the neighborhood. It's everywhere. Yeah, 
sometimes very bitter. Yeah. yeah. And well, this cardinal was just having a good old time with these. I, I, I seem to, what, what so, around. okay, so yeah, yeah. well, I do that perhaps um, in a little bit. But don't eat things because cardinals do. I'm pretty sure it's bittersweet fine, but I have to sit down with my plant book. <laughs> so not to confuse the berries I'm talking about and the berries that are going around. This is actually something important when I go on a plant walk. I really ask people to not talk about multiple plants at the same time because somebody will hear me say, that's edible. I'm going to say I'm not going to eat that plant because I don't know what it is. Um, but I am going to pass around something with berries that are super edible, super invasive, and that you should all go home because it has, and make jam and chutney because they have tremendous amounts of lycopene. I'm not saying that plant has lycopene that's going around. <laughs> I mean, it just happens. Like you get in a big group, you have side conversations, and all of a sudden things people are saying multiple things, and then they think it's edible, and it can be made into fruit leather. I've <laughs> not said that. <laughs> What is that? So one? this one is autumn olive. Oh. Autumn olive planted actually a colleague that reviewed one of my one of my colleagues that reviewed my book. Autumn olive. It's a shrub with silvery underside leaves that grows from about 10 to 15 feet tall. Um, they planted these bushes. The conservation corps planted them in the 60s. <laughs> yeah, exactly. See what I was saying earlier about humans planting one thing because they thought it was a good idea. 40 years later, we're trying to cut it back and spray it with herbicide treatment at nature centers because it's super invasive. Meet the autumn olive. It's a beautiful bush. Um, you know, and I, it is, it is really... Um, Aren't those also called the uh, Indian spice berry? No. That's a different plant. That's different? Spice bush is a different plant. Delicious plant. Not as, definitely not as invasive. Or not invasive. Um, or like, laurel berry? I don't know if it's called, I've not heard it called laurel berry. The autumn okay. olive. Um, I could see how that might get its name if that's the case. i got to get a good look at it because I think I've eaten a lot of those. Yeah, well I'm going to pass around a bowl of them. Some of them ended up green. You know, I was kind of in a, I wasn't in a hurry today, but I didn't have the luxury of a huge languishing foraging um, adventure. But the autumn olive um, goes to flower in early spring. Uh, May, I don't know, second week of spring, like May 7th-ish, with these beautiful yellow flowers that have a dusty aroma, kind of like musky dusty, almost underworldly like. And some people, especially pregnant women, don't like the smell of them. They're just notably aromatic. The flowers themselves, if you were into making face hydrosols or distilling them for face mist, so you could get into that. But the berries are super delicious. Go ahead and pass them around. You can take one. Eat the darker red ones. They're better than the, the green ones. The green ones are not good at all. Um, they're really astringent. They're tart. They're sour. They're, if you take a moment to really pay attention to the, the, the surface of the berry, it's silvery, dotted with little flecks of um, yellow. There's really no other berry that looks like that one. The branch I'm passing around, you'll see how it grows in little clusters alternate among, along the stem. Um, for me, I and it's astringent. It's sour, astringent, um, tannic. There are a little bit of tannins in the skin. Your mouth will dry up, but it does incite you to, it makes you pucker. For runners, that's one of those trail foods. Um, it's high in vitamin C and lycopene. So it's as, if not higher in lycopene than tomatoes. So, you know, and it's abundant. It's really abundant. Um, you know, again, it's one of those really invasive plants that we try to get rid of, but it offers a delicious food. It's got a singular seed on the inside. Um, you can feel free to take one off the plant if you wish. Um, I don't mind the seeds. I don't mind, some people really, when you start to work with wild plants, you kind of have to negotiate textures and pattern, and not textures, but textures and textures. Some things might be a little chewy, chewy. Frequently, if you come to my house for dinner, invariably I'll watch one of you pick sticks out of your mouth. That could be more for the fact that I hate picking sticks out of things or really garbling well. It's, I'm just, I also don't measure when I bake. Um, that's more me. But when you cook them down, these make a really nice chutney. I make a chutney for, um, you'd mentioned the spice bush. 
I, adding like the spice bush berry because it tastes like all spice. You can make a really nice local flavored chutney for turkey for like Thanksgiving. Um, fruit leathers. I feel it cooks down enough that the seeds can be negligible. If you really have somebody in your family that can't handle seeds or little plant parts, you can run it through a food mill. Your batch through a food mill when you, you process it so it has a more smooth consistency. Or turn it into fruit leather. It makes a really, really, really yummy high in vitamin C tart fruit leather. My daughter loves autumn olive berries. Anybody else use some for food at all? Yes. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to make a few comments about these things. Mm -hmm. These range from a dark red to almost a yellow. Yeah. And um, the yellow ones are more acidic. And the dark red ones Damn. taste almost like prunes. They're, they're sweet. Yummy. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're, they're delicious. There's a, did you get to the bucket? I brought a bucket of them. No, I didn't yet. But, um, but um, the bees in spring love these flowers, and it produces a very robust uh, musky type honey. It's wonderful. You know, like a friend of mine has a lot of autumn olive in Ada and you know, he wanted to do some landscaping and we were talking about it in the springtime and like I was looking at these trees yeah. and they were full of honeybees and I was just kind of at a loss and like how can we you know, removing these, and again, it's more philosophical than anything else, but like, how could we deem something so full of vitality yep. like, with all of these pollinators? I mean, it was, it was my, beautiful. My place in Ada is full of these things. Yeah, I, yeah, same. bees. Yeah, and, the, 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 and it was one of those moments, I was looking at all of the bees in the sunshine with this plant, and I'm like, how can this plant be bad? I mean, there's a. I mean, it can be because it's invasive and it can take over everything. But it just, and again, it's a more a philosophical well, thing. You know, as I, I used quote. to say that about burdock too. You know, I curse that burdock. But then in the fall, the um, the uh, goldfinches would feed on the seeds, and it was beautiful. They're all over these burdock, yeah. eating the seeds. You know, there's worse. The the earth is smarter than we are. The <laughs> earth. And we seem to deem, I mean, we make judgments on plants the same way we make judgments on people. If we can't see, see an immediate use for something, then if we can't see commercial value out of it, then it must be bad or it must not have a value. And I mean, looking, what, and I, I, again, like what I started with, getting outside and paying attention to these things and to kind of, it brings us into a better awareness of the natural world and makes, I mean, we can't outsmart nature. Nature has amazing systems <laughs> that can guide a lot of our, you know, human design and human thinking um, if we pay attention and if we really, and challenge some of the things that we think about ecology and preservation and conservation. I mean, I don't have the answers. I have more questions than I have the answers every time I go outside. I mean, aside from, you know, knowing if it tastes good and it's not going to kill me dead. <laughs> or like catnip. I love catnip. I didn't even bring catnip, but... So yeah, I thank you for having... I'm glad that we share that in common because I, I just feel... I feel the plant needs to be stood up for. <laughs> it does. A wonderful, wonderful plant. I, I taught my dog to eat that stuff. You'd never starve. Uh, well, you know, acorns. I, I, it's like I'm torn. Do I want to talk about acorns? We'll talk about acorns and goldenrod. We'll talk about acorns and goldenrod. And nettles. And then, huh? And nettles. Yeah. And nettles. I didn't even bring nettles. We have to go out on a plant walk for nettles. I have, um, oh, spring plant walks. I really love nettles. I really love acorns, too. We'll talk about goldenrod and then acorns. So goldenrod. Goldenrod is one of my favorite. Oh, I, I say that about everything, really. Quite before I go on to another plant, any questions about autumn olive? No. Just sure. a general question. Like, if you identify something that you really like from a forageable standpoint, mm -hmm. are are they then cultivatable? Oh yeah, in terms yeah, yeah. Of, of like creating your own foraging environment. So the question, and that's a really good question, you know, are a lot of the plants cultivatable? Yes. In fact, I really am a big proponent of what's called permaculture, designing spaces 
and land um, that, that aren't, don't mimic. But you know, so you have woodland gardens and you know, debate that you know, really cultivating rich woodland gardens with like a nice healthy understory, you know, with edible nuts and a healthy canopy. Um, berries along the edges of the, the hedgerows. I mean, that's where you find the berries, right? That's where you find, I brought raspberry leaves. It's like, I wanna talk about all these things, but we really would be here all night. Um, you just have to come to another class. <laughs> um, you know, adding berries to the hedgerow. Sometimes the wild plants just have a thing, you know, they'll, some of them will just have, they'll grow where they want to grow. Like they have, I'll try to cultivate weeds, I'll try to cultivate mullein, I'll try, you know, I'll try to plant burdock, and they, you know, they'll grow where they want to grow. So, and that might just be the lazy gardener in me, but it also, I mean, I really love to encourage people to plant edible spaces around their home. Because at that point, then, then you know the history of it. You know yeah. that it hasn't been treated. You know that you aren't going to over-cultivate it. Or, yep. The wild leeks are a great example. There are a couple of farmers in southeast Michigan that are growing stock based on wild cultivars, um, you know, propagating it for home gardeners. And, you know, I've transplanted, you know, in the field, I transplant to different places to help cultivate stuff. Um, but I've also, I've added those plants into my own woodland gullies. And so I, I know how much I can take and how much I can use. And honestly, the, back to the wild leek, Clipping the tops only is truly the only sustainable use of the plant, and that's um, one of the native traditions is to only, in the Cherokee tradition, to only use the tops. So, I mean, to cultivate those spaces um, in your own home environments is really, it's, it, it, it just makes healthy land around you. So I'm a huge, huge, huge proponent and play around with it. Like if you have that type of interest to, to graft rootstock, to graft you know, different trees, um, play with it and have fun with it. And I think I do love people also planting landscape that's edible, like cows and dogwood that has an edible fruit. And just multi-purpose that's good for both people, pollinators and birds and animals and things. So, so the long answer, yes. Um, the goldenrod. I could talk an hour about goldenrod. Um, the goldenrod is a plant of summer. I'm in August birthday, right about August 18. And um, right about that time, like summer ends and the light changes and it turns into the long shadows and the blue skies that you get for September and fall. And all of a sudden, everything's goldenrod. Um, we also, at the same time, everybody, I hear the sneezes, gets their allergies. Well, goldenrod, people, people seem to think that it's goldenrod that causes the allergies and hay fever. It's really the ragweed that grows right adjacent to the goldenrod. Invariably, where there's goldenrod, there's also ragweed. Ragweed's pollen is airborne and light. Goldenrod's pollens are too heavy. If you actually watch the honeybees in the goldenrod and they collect the pollen, you can see the goldenrod pollen on the feet of the bees. It's kind of neat. Um, the goldenrod, so what do I want to say about goldenrod? Where to start? I'm going to pass this around. There are about 20 species of goldenrod in Michigan and in the Great Lakes area. And um, you'll notice that like when you go out into the field, all different arrangements of goldenrods. They all have a notable characteristic, however. The blossoms are slightly aromatic, um, but the blossoms also are bitter and astringent as well as the leaves, okay? And by bitter and astringent, I'm gonna pass this around and encourage you to take a little piece of flower and a little piece of leaf and give it a taste separately. Because plant parts, as I said with wild carrot, um, all plant parts can sometimes taste different. The flowers are aromatic, the leaves are more bitter and astringent. Um, so what does that mean, bitter and astringent? We, I talked about bitter plants earlier, that bitter plants can help stimulate digestion. Astringent plants 
whether you have them as a tea, whether you just chew them in your mouth, whether you make them into an herbal tincture, it doesn't matter if it's an alcohol-based tincture or a vinegar tincture. Um, astringent plants will just dry up your mouth. It'll tighten and tone tissues. If you were to wash wounds with astringent plants, it can help um, dry up a wet weepy rash of poison ivy, for example. I don't use goldenrod for poison ivy, but there's some astringent plants that I do use for poison ivy or for burns to dry up lax tissues. Um, goldenrod. Oh, where do I want to go with goldenrod? That hay fever that that ragweed is causing, goldenrod is your antidote for that ragweed. It's leaky drippy. I put that into my leaky drippy blend with a couple other really great plants. Um, cat allergies. Goldenrod. Goldenrod is a tincture. Extract um, an extract in like a vodka or a glyceride if you choose not to use alcohol. Taken in big drops can help nip those cat allergies in the bud. Um, I won't get into colds because you don't want to stop a runny nose from a cold, right? That's a little different than a runny nose from an allergy. Why? Why are they different? Exactly. Yeah, the runny nose from a cold is an immune response. I mean, Technically, the runny nose from a cat allergy is also immune response, but trying to take care of your runny nose from your cat allergy is different than stopping a runny nose from a cold or a flu. Go ahead. I have noticed that if you give up dairy, your allergies go away. Truth. So, dairy. The, the comment was giving up dairy will help allergies. In fact, I do an allergies class in the springtime. Um, Anytime you can reduce the, the load on your system, reducing alcohol, reducing coffee, reduce, which I'm terrible at doing, um, <laughs> reducing dairy, anything that puts that additional load on your system to metabolize um, will help you deal with other environmental allergies, which leads me to a wonderful use of, of um, goldenrod as a digestive tonic. That bitterness um, can help stimulate digestion. I was on a run, this was during my birthday week. My birthday week included tons of dairy. Never met a loaf of brie that I didn't like. Triple cream brie, preferably please. Goat cheese, love goat cheese. Love Furniture City Creamery. Who doesn't love Furniture City Creamery, right? If you haven't been, you really have to go. Best vanilla ice cream in, like I think that I've ever had. I've, yeah, that's worth lactose intolerance right there, okay? <laughs> yeah, there's some things worth it. I've got one of those stomachs, not immediately lactose intolerant, but my body tells me when we're done with lactose. On a run, I decided to to eat the leftover butterscotch pudding from my birthday dinner at Grove, really close to going out for a run, I thought, it's just butterscotch pudding, how bad could it be? I'm used to gels, like in goos. Mm -hmm. Butterscotch pudding is really just a goo in disguise. <laughs> like all these reps, like, I could eat a bunch of it. I ate way too much, eight miles away from my house, and I normally don't get intestinal distress when I run. But for some reason, this butterscotch pudding was not a good idea. And it was a really inconvenient, you know, issue. I'm like, I actually have to walk. And my stomach was like all chicken winged up. It didn't know if things wanted to go up or down. I just actually just wanted it to have like some sort of stasis. I'm in this field of goldenrod. And for me, I've been in a lot of different um, environments. Uh, worked in a clinic in Nicaragua where we didn't have the plant, working with local um, NDs and MDs and a couple of local herbalists, where we didn't have medicines that we would like to use. So used to substituting for different ailments, and I quickly thought, goldenrod. I would use digestive bitters of gentian, Oregon grape root, like for serious stomach distress to help you know, stimulate that digestive process, all chicken winged up from dairy or butterscotch pudding but all I had access to was goldenrod. And so I took some of the flowers and I put it in my, my mouth and I just kind of put then a lot more in my mouth and just really hoping I didn't have to call home and ask for a lift. Like I'm not one, you know, this was like, this was a bad idea. I didn't, don't try new foods and then go for a longer run. <laughs> and honestly, I felt 
things kind of click into gear. It's aromatic. So aromatic herbs can stimulate digestion. Think of the corianders. Think of all of our curries, the caraway seeds, the dills. So these flowers have these aromatics and bitter flavors that work as what the word is, is carminative. It can help stimulate digestion. And I'll tell you, I was really happy to have goldenrod, you know, on hand. Um, so I will always, you know, I, and I've used it for, I, I have other herbs I'd prefer for digestion, but as a field remedy for upset <laughs> dairy stomach, give it a try. I mean, I wouldn't suggest it as, as a substitute for lactate or some of your medicines if you need them, but good in a pinch. Are you putting, <clears throat> are you putting yogurt in the dairy? So that's think? a whole other class, the difference of fermented foods okay. and, but if my system, personally, if my system's overloaded, there are some yogurts I can do and some yogurts I can't do. It's really, you know, I got one of those stomachs. <laughs> so, but fermented foods, probiotics, I mean, fermented foods are good in general over conventional dairy, absolutely. Another question. Um, you mentioned there were 20 some species. Mm -hmm. um, are they all edible? Yes, they're all edible, they're all interchangeable, they all have, um, similar characteristics and usability so they're definitely interchangeable how i choose my goldenrod it has to be a sunny day so the latin root for the word is uh, soledago and sol means sun so it's a plant of the sun um, i find my goldenrod by following the honeybees um, you know my dad really instilled in me when i was young to love our bees i'm grateful to him for that and to me, I feel the bees are our Earth's first herbalists and farmers, right? They tell us the plants that have the most nectar. They, they, they cultivate. They're our first cultivators. They're our cross-pollinators. They, those bees, watch the bees, they know. <laughs> bees know. So they always choose the most aromatic plants. And if you want to, do I have any beer makers in, in the room? Beer brewers, good. The flowers, if you dry the, the, the tricky thing with the um, goldenrod is that if you go to, it's an aster family plant, so the minute these go to, to dry, they dry in these little poofs, okay? They don't dry nice like rose petals. They go to this poof stage, which if you're in a field, you'll see plants of different stages and they'll go to this fluffy white. So if you want to dry it, I always dry um, large bundles of it with a loosely fitting like paper grocery sack over top of it. So you're not mad because all of the little poofs have covered your carpet. Okay, pro tip. I've done that so you don't have to. <laughs> um, for my beer brewers, the aromatics work really nicely as a fresh plant in the second, um, when you go ahead to add in your second fermentation and boiling, but you don't want to over boil the plant because it'll extract the bitters. You want to really just have it in there for a bit of time to get the aromatics out, okay? Too much long boiling of this will just make you, it'll make your ales way, in my opinion, way too bitter. Um, and that's not what you're really looking for. You're looking for using the, the fresh aromatics of the plant um, that I think it's really pretty. Leaky, drippy, stomach digestive aid, nice culinary flavoring for brewing. Musculoskeletal. Um, Matt Wood's an herbalist out of Minnesota, and he likens this, um, well, I've actually used this quite a bit for musculoskeletal, um, musculoskeletal bursitis type. Um, remedy extracted in olive oil as a massage. So the leaf and the flowers extracted into the oil, um, or even topically as a tea, as a, limit, a liniment, or a tincture as a poultice on bursitis, um, mixed with plants like yarrow or St. John's wort can help um, as a first aid remedy and can help um, the bursitis, like ski boot bursitis. Anybody experience like ski boot bursitis? Any or hockey skate bursitis, or the type of bursitis that might come from having a 
I've got my ski coach back here, my, my, ski, my ski patrol, ski patrol, like trauma, blunt trauma, and you end up with a side, you know, past the, the immediate stages of your, your swelling, and after the swelling's gone down, but you can still have that swelling on the joint. Um, it's a really wonderful massage oil for rheumatoid damp arthritis also excellent. I mix it sometimes with um, cayenne or ginger to put on the skin to help warm damp and cold muscles and cold joints. Helping that circulation get to the joint helps relieve some of the damp creakiness. Um, fibromyalgia, I've had a couple of clients that have really found um, the golden, gosh, one of, one of my gentleman friends really suffers from a lot of rheumatoid arthritis. Straight goldenrod oil. Um, it's like I offered some to him and I watched him put it on his wrists, his elbows, his knees, and he was like, this stuff is great! <laughs> I'm just like, huh, there you go. And I mean, just some of that damp, again, that damp rheumatic um, tissue, just the aching arthritis pain that can come. It's not like a topical analgesic like you might um, find like with an icy hot type. It's more of a, it's definitely a different type of, of ointment's not the right word, but um, soothing that the plant can bring. I just encourage other people. I've, I've had enough personal musculoskeletal injuries that this is something that goes into my, my um, plant first aid kit. So goldenrod mixes well with a lot of other different plants for different different things too. Mullen, mullen's good for back injuries. So a question about goldenrod. Anybody want to taste it again? You yeah. cook with it? For culinary flavoring, I really don't, aside from the brew, the beer brewing and Belgian ales. And Belgian ales specifically, if you try to over hop it, I think you lose the nuance of the flavor. Um, you know, the, again, it's urinary tract infections. It is really diuretic. I didn't didn't even think of the urinary tract. So in addition to cranberry, um, you want those astringent plants. Um, drinking lots of goldenrod tea, it's extremely diuretic. I, those that may have kidney issues or bladder, like really chronic issues, I may even steer away from the, the goldenrod because it can be pretty aggressive as a diuretic. But really helpful for a common urinary tract infection can help clear that up with echinacea and can be safely used adjacent to any antibiotics that you might get be given from your MD. But as a as a food, I just don't like put it into salads. But it's just a helpful plant to get to know. No, it's virtues because not a lot of people would ascribe virtues to goldenrod. So. We've got time for one more question. Questions up to this point before we talk about acorns? Oh, it's super easy. Crock pot, double boiler, like glass jar, put the plant material, cut it up, plant material in it, cover with it with oil, simmer it in the crock pot for four to five days, make sure all any moisture would evaporate out of it strain it off, and you can Google online for a basic salve recipe, or you can use it straight as a massage oil, just that way. It's really that easy. I mean, it's basic folk medicine 101 that people have been doing for a hundred years. Or send me a message and I can help you, you know, send you links. But you can extract lots of different plants in that way. It's just a simple um, electric method. People, you know, there are tons of different ways. Solar method, there's, um, you know, putting in a dark closet. I don't like botulism and I don't like trusting, like, this lack of sun in Michigan to extract my oil. So I just use a crock pot and a double boiler so I'm not cooking my herbs. And um, as long as I keep the crock pot full of water, I can leave it on all day. And you just keep adding water as, as long as you're mindful of it. You don't want to create a house fire making your herbal salves. But um, four to five days, usually that's generally enough time to get the, the moisture content out of the plant because you don't want molds or anything to be growing in your oils and salves because that can ruin it and cause botulism, which even though you're not eating it internally, topical botulism is 
that's not what you're going for. <laughs> Botox. What's that? Free Botox. Free Botox. Yeah, I don't. I, yeah, exactly. I don't, I don't know. You know, I mean, I, I definitely love to err on the side of food safety. So acorns, acorns. These actually, I gathered this spring and threw them in the freezer. And I need to go through and crush them. So I pulled them out of the freezer. I'm gonna pass these around. Actually, if you well, if you want to later, you can go ahead and come up and try my nutcracker. My dad left me this nutcracker. A really fun story. Acorns are one of our most perfect Midwest plant proteins. Um, you know, high as a plant carbohydrate. You know, carbohydrates as a forager is one of the biggest challenges. I mean, you can forage for meats, you know, hunt, and you can get greens, but finding adequate carbohydrates so you get, you know, a nice. So you have just your caloric need met. Acorns, chestnuts. Um, acorn, I love chestnuts. Love, love, love chestnuts. But acorns can help meet that caloric need. So the thing about acorns, people, you know, a lot of literature you'll read, well, you know, um, the red oaks are more tannic, the white oaks have less tannins, and people will say go for the white oaks, not the red oaks. Last year, I put up 10 pounds of acorn flour, primarily um, across the span of a month. Gathering nuts, um, if I were to sit there and pick out all of them between the white and the reds, I would have never gotten all the flour I needed. Um, but the acorns are quite tannic, and tannic meaning primarily the, you know, the tannins in the nut will dry up your mouth and you'll say, oh, they're bitter and they're just not palatable fresh. Um, so acorns need to be leached. And leached, what leaching does, you can do it with hot water, you can do it with cold water. It helps extract those tannins um, and make those the flavors of the acorn more palatable also. <clears throat> I got plants stuck in my mouth, back in my throat. It's the golden bud. Um, you know, the leaching can also take out the fats in the acorns. Um, so what you want to do is, anybody currently process acorn flour? You should try it. <laughs> so, you know, a cold water process, some people put their acorns in a, in a pillowcase and put it in their tank, in their toilet. Okay, this is after you shell and peel these nuts. Um, the repeated flushing actually flushes the water through, rinsing the tannins off naturally. Now, as a mother of children with a hundred other things to do, you know, part of me just says that's nice, but what I've done is I've put these nut meats into a pot, turn on the heat, boil them up. Um, you know, I can scoop off the oils. As I boil them, it almost seems to cook them down to create them to have a flavor similar to shiitake. So I talked about wild flavors, and cooked nuts have a meaty flavor to them. They can have this really, part of it's the oils. Um, you know, chemically, I'm not sure what happens to make them smell like shiitake mushrooms in my kitchen. They don't necessarily taste like shiitake mushrooms. Well, that's not true. The cooked nut meats kind of do taste like shiitake mushrooms. Um, after I've run them through one leaching process, I put the mash in a dehydrator, and then I send it through my KitchenAid coffee grinder. This is like, brought some of this to pass around. And then I put it into canning jars and bags, and I put it into the freezer for the winter. And I'll pass it around. And it's, it's not a, a traditional flour, so I say acorn flour, and it's, um, you can go ahead and pass this around and even taste it if you want. Put your nose into it and maybe pinch a little off and give it a smell. It's a really complex flavor. I stir it into granola. I stir it into baked goods. I make banana bread with it. I am a coffee addict, which one of my dear friends here knows. Actually, probably most of you that know me know I love herbs, but coffee is my favorite herb. 
Um, I will boil stovetop acorns and coffee to make a really nice chai, like local chai latte. And I'll add in burdock root, dandelion root, a little bit of spice bush, sweeten it with maple syrup, and a little bit of um, either, you know, a nice heavy cream or even soy milk, you know, if you can't do, if, I, if I'm in one of those, I can't do dairy moments. Um, but it's just a really delicious way, uh, you know, I use it similarly to flax as a, you know, an, an additional plant with high in plant proteins and carbohydrates, add it to smoothies. So, isn't that neat? Oh, you're giving it's me a, a face. It is bitter. I, I mean, you're not going to eat flour raw, but if you're stirring it into granola with honey, with, with nuts, I mean with like walnuts, local walnuts, if you um, have the, the abundance of local <coughs> walnuts or like gold, if you take the time to process them. But you can stir it in and it's, it is bitter if you're eating it on its own, but if you add it into foods, stirring it into oatmeal, stirring it into oat bran with just drizzles of maple syrup, like how can you go wrong if you have maple syrup, right? Yeah. So those are just different ways well, I like What to kind of that. proportions? You know, how much do you put in? Baking, um, so this is where baking gets tricky. I am not the best flour blender. So if you were to ask me for ratios, um, I just sort of add more and make sure the liquids work out. Well, okay. <laughs> Midwest you, foraging is not a cookbook. You, you, you <laughs> understand, but uh, you blend it with other flours. Presumably, yes. wheat or oat yeah, flour, yeah, right? A basic, a basic standard okay. recipe. Right, okay, so you're talking about like one quarter, one third? Uh, you know, I take out a half a cup of regular flour and add in like a, a, a half a cup of, of acorn flour. So because you be, still want your bread to rise. Right, so right? it may be half and half. Ish, yeah. Yeah, okay, ish. well. But the ish factor, like, this is where it gets slippery. Yeah. I, like, in my book, I think I actually write. Consult an experienced baker for proper substitutions. That's not me. Like I'm a soup maker and a smoothie maker, and like did I then like I'll blend it into things that we don't matter in the end. I don't bake very well, sir. <laughs> I just wanted an idea because yeah, I'm ish. fairly experienced. Okay, good, dude. If you have a recipe and it works out, send it to me. We'll, we'll totally work in partnership. I'll bring you flour. You can experiment. Tell me what works. Listen, I like you. Um, so I did gather them in the fall. In fact, um, my dad was at his end of life last year, and over three weeks since I didn't knit, I gathered acorns. That is one way, actually, to acquire the ten pounds or more than ten pounds, the X number of pounds, however, that yielded me all the acorn flour. This was a red oak up north that had dropped its acorns the season before. So, again, nature's funny. We talked about this leaching process. Red oaks have more tannins than white oaks. If you gather red oaks in the springtime, they have about the similar tannin content by the time the snows have washed through and they've not sprouted. They sprout later and differently than the white oaks then you end up with these nut meats that I just threw in the freezer because I didn't have time to do anything with them in the springtime. And I figured I'd probably have a lecture at Schuler's before my other nut harvest came, and so I just needed some acorns on hand. <laughs> <laughs> the rhyme and reason is so random. But you know, it's just part of the, the kitchen preservation. But knowing that those red oaks have been sitting over winter and leaching, I can actually just shell these dehydrate them straight and throw them into the blender. I'm not going to bother leaching them because they've been sitting all winter. And then they've been sitting in my freezer. When you freeze plant material, that changes the cellular structure of the plant and it helps break it down just by freezing it. So again, that, that just adds to, it can help diminish my processing time on the other side. I hope you've looked at their acorns differently. Yes. No, I was just picking acorns that you find randomly off the ground. That's safe. Depends on where you're at. I am a I'm a rabid acorn collector. I mean, I wouldn't collect them in areas of washout in the street in a busy road where there's a lot of brake dust, because everything that washes off into the street 
there's a lot of stuff that unfortunately ends up in our water systems. If you're on a nice trail, um, footpaths, out in the woods, you know, gather them away from dog spray, of course. Uh, the first mass that falls, you generally want to go ahead and um, let those be. They'll be the first round that isn't the best mass uh, harvest of acorns. <coughs> Excuse me. It's the ones that are going to fall right about now, the third week of September on, that are the really good ones to get. So that's what you know, what about Florida live oak? Sorry? Florida live oak. Florida live oak. I'm not aware of Florida live oak. Well, they have smaller acorns. Oh, the little ones? Are those like the, they're, they're a, a red oak species? We have I here? don't know that. They, they look different than up here. They got real small leaves. I mean, oaks across the country are pretty, again, they're, they're tannic, astringent, and they've been used, you know, from a, a bit ethnobotanical perspective across time. Mm -hmm. In terms of flavor profile, I'm not really familiar with species. I've, I've got a girlfriend in LA, and she forages in the mountains in California, and we'll talk about flavor profiles. But, you know, they're bitter, astringent, you need to do some tannin processing, and taste them as you go along. I'm known to bite into acorns as I'm gathering them to think, are these, and some of them do actually taste like almonds every once in a while. You'll just get one that you can eat fresh. Yeah. I have about a five gallon bucket of acorns sitting in my garage. They've been sitting there for over a year. Are those still possible to leach? You know, I might crack them open, make sure they've not rotted or have, I mean, you're going to end up with bug infestations. They've been on a, like a flat surface, actually. Hmm. I crack them open and give them a taste and check the quality of nut meat. Okay. So again, it's like learning. It's like I always get these questions, primarily on Facebook. Lisa, should I throw this out? It has a funny smell. What am I? <laughs> we need to relearn this common sense kitchen stuff. Like, does it have a funny smell? If in doubt, compost it. You know, is it, you know, just... T test out the density. Is it mealy? Is it gnar? Is it funky? Mealy, mealy, gnar, and funky. I mean, you'll know. Mealy, gnarly, funky, swampy. <coughs> the tea's been on your counter for four days. It's probably got a swamp flavor to it, regardless of the type of tea. <laughs> and again, these are all these common sense. When I said at the beginning, how long does it take for you to start doing some of these things? It's just experience, you know, it's being in the kitchen, it's incorporating my common sense as a cook, it's incorporating my common sense as a gardener, it's incorporating my sen common sense as an outdoors person. You know, all of those experiences come into play, you know, and it just in informs you how to work with plants, how to taste things, and, and kind of be fearless, as long as you know what it is and aren't poisoning yourself. Please, nobody gets poisoned on my watch. I've told you to do your ID first. I gotta ask about uh -huh. nettles. I've heard you <laughs> because we've got nettles where my garden is supposed to be. You're a lucky woman. I'm a lucky opinion. woman, but I don't think so. So he's going, in. oh man, those are nettles. So I'm about ready to pull them out. No! I know, I go to the farmer's market and they're selling these little baggies full of nettles for four bucks. I go, I four dollars. Yeah, I come home and I'm telling him about these things. Go, no, no, no. So we go online and there's like nettles and pasta sauce. And oh my gosh! Seriously, nettles are the most wonderful green plant. You you have been blessed with food that's more nutritious than spinach, my dear one. But I don't know what. So they my taste like spinach. Said I can only do this in the spring. Use them in the spring. So you want to gather nettles that are tender and younger. You can gather them, uh, the quality of the plant changes. So as it grows and goes to seed, yes, you can still eat nettles that are in flower and have gone to seed. You are not going to die from, the, some of the stuff I read online, this is confounding. It's like, I've eaten nettles in flower and I'm still here. So, but they're not choice. They're going to be tough, they're going to be dry, they're not going to have much flavor. The nettles in the spring and in the fall, and this just comes with experience. You'll you'll work with the plant. You'll find what's good. You could chop them in the spring and fall. You can blanch them, freeze them. Pesto. I make an awesome nettle, basil, garlic, mustard pesto. That's like just this amalgam of just randomness that I seriously put on toast all the time. 
and it's, I mean, it's high in plant proteins. It's like the most magnesium and calcium you can get out of any green vegetable. It's like off the charts. So, I mean, work with it. I use it in place of any, I mean, sauteed, oh my goodness, butter. Sticks worth of butter. I don't know if you like butter. I love, I love butter. butter. <laughs> I never met a stick of butter I didn't like. Um, you know, just the flavors of that green. I, I, my body craves nettles. Like, we're all really nutrient deficient because of the way our food's grown, industrialized, you know, industrialized farming. Yeah. And nettles are just one of those wild foods I get super, like, and like flowers, you know, acorn. Like, these foods we've been eating from the grocery store have been overbred and you know selected for portability and not for nutrients. So when you go back to these wild foods, your body's like, oh my gosh, where have you been all my life? Nettles. Like seriously, your husband's dead out. Yeah. Like, good job, <laughs> sir. Well how, do you, how do you deal with the stinging? So this, and the, so the fomic acid, it's just they're they're not thorns. People think they're thorns. But they're little fluid-filled sacs of fomic acid that break off and cause a histamine reaction in the skin. It feels like you've rolled in fiber glass. And everybody's reaction is different because everybody has different histamine reactions. But you've not, you know, you've not gotten into a, it's not poisonous rash, like poison ivy or anything. It's just really aggravating. Um, you can roll the leaves inside out fresh and get around the sting. But when you cook them, the fomic acid dries up. Or if you dry them, the fomic acid dries up. So just the heat or the processing will take away the So stain. you pick them with gloves or yeah, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there have been times when I've picked them without gloves. Part of it's like, the vitality of springtime. Let me pick nettles to remind me that I'm alive. And then I always <laughs> complain because I feel like I rolled in fiberglass. <laughs> <laughs> My hands, hands are on fire. fire. Yeah, exactly. It's like processing salsa and peppers without gloves. You, you just, it's, it's unnecessary, really. But, you know, it can be done. <coughs> Nettles are awesome. Would I want to cut these down, the small? I mean, the, well, the small shoots will come up. You can. You can see what happens. I've never really cut. See, that's, that's when then you just end up cultivating a nettle bed. And I, I guess I've never thought, they'll come back. Yeah, you cut them back. They'll grow back. Love that nettle, nettle part. That's like special. Because the $4 a bag at the farmer's market, that's insane. I, don't, I can't even wrap my arms around. Will they ever find a use for miscanthus? Remind me what miscanthus is. It's all that weedy stuff and all the all the um, rivers, edges, lakes, edges. Phragmites? Yes. yes. The Phragmites, I have no idea, but it's horrible. I know. If you think they find some use for it, they can cut it down and manufacture it and make all its own. It, you know, it probably can be used for cordage. For what? Cordage, like a cordage plant. I mean, I don't, I, I don't know how much cordage we're all making out of our wetlands lately here in the United States because that's been farmed out to different countries. <laughs> but I mean, like some of the, we used to use plants in these different ways for food, fiber, and shelter. So I wish we could build a campfire. Was it interesting? Did you learn stuff? Yeah. Yay!